Namaste, Namaste Ji. Namaste Ji. May I welcome you to my heart and to the Temple of Kriya Yoga. I would like to talk to you today about obstacles on the pathway or overcoming the obstacles on your pathway. I suppose the first question we have to ask is, what is the path? And is everybody on the path? The answer is no, very few people are on the path. What is the path? The path is really your life. Well, simply your life. But it becomes a path only when you consciously live it. Being on the path means living consciously. I think it's really as simple as that. So everybody's living, but not everybody's on the path. Being on the path means basically turning around and consciously being aware of where you're going, why you're going, and how to get there. Of course, they oftentimes talk about the path as being, as it were, a, a spiritual process. It is a spiritual process because the whole goal of all the sadhana, all the techniques, all the principles of yama, nayama, san, pranayama, pachahara, all of these things basically manifest <clears throat> in terms of greater self-awareness so that you know how to think, what to think, how to speak, what to speak, what to do, what not to do, and obviously when to do it. What are the obstacles? Well, that's a good question. I suppose in one sense, obstacles on the path are those things that primarily cause you to lose your focus or your awareness. Uh, the big one is emotionality. Ah, that's a good one. So we need to think and reflect as we're moving along the path as what causes me to be emotional? Or what causes my mind to be emotional if you want to be more accurate? And what can I do about it? Well, historically the answer is attain a state of detachment. Attain a state of detachment. It all boils down to this very important concept of you have the right to work, but not to the fruits of the work. You have a right to plant the tree, water the tree. You don't have a right to eat the fruit of the tree. It upsets many people. But it's why people aren't on the path. They're not on the path because they're doing something to get something. Therefore, they're really not living. The whole idea of the path, spiritual or otherwise, is to become aware that we are doing what we're doing because we feel it's of value, or we do what we're doing because it truly brings us joy. I didn't say pleasure. Joy. Hopefully there will be some pleasure there. But people always say, you know, they don't want a job that will give them satisfaction. Most people. They don't want a job that will turn around and cause them to uh, find satisfaction in it. They do is they want a job that brings in money. Money is the goal. And so then, therefore, they pick the job they hate, forgive me. Uh, I can remember, yeah, this is 40, 50, must be 55 years ago or so. We, we hired a man <coughs> to solve some problems in the, in the, in the company. And uh, the boss hired him and gave him an enormous salary. And it was about three days later he comes in and says to the boss, Dude, this is a terrible, absolutely stinky job, all sorts of crazy people, etc., etc." The boss says, do you think I was giving you the money because I liked you? And he couldn't understand when he was getting this enormous salary. It's because basically it was an enormous job that needed to be done. The obstacles are those emotions that cause you to lose your self-awareness. The obstacles are those emotions that cause you to lose your temper. Obstacles are those emotions and stresses and strains that are all internal that really simply cause you to lose awareness of what you're doing and why you're doing it. At least in the early stages.
What should we accomplish on the path? Well, the path is the goal. The goal is the path. The path is your awareness, your self-awareness. The goal has many levels. To be happy, to be content, to be peaceful, to be a blessing to people, to be a joy to be around, that sort of thing. All simple sociological personality traits, but all important. It's the first step. As my guru said, it, pay your great deal of attention, Kriyananda, to make your earth life as harmonious as possible. And I said, I don't understand that. Why? I thought it was about the spiritual life. He says, yes, it is. <clears throat> but nobody seems to have any time for the spiritual life. They're so busy with the earth life. So you simplify, 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 he said to me. Keep simplifying your earth life. Simplify it, simplify it. Make it more harmonious and simplify it. This will give you time and energy to go deeper into the path, upon the path. So, this is the way I was taught in the 40s. Okay, you're taking up yoga, okay, you're taking up mysticism. Uh, you're on the path now. And then he said to me, uh, visualize the end of the path. Visualize, you know, whether it's 50 years or 60 years or 80 years. Visualize way down the path to the end of the path. What do you see there? What do you imagine there? What do you want to receive at the end of the path? What is the goal, a pot of gold, symbolically speaking, at the end of the path? How about what ought be there? That's a good one. That caused me to do a lot of thinking. And slowly he led me around, a few weeks later lead me around, to come to ask the question slightly differently. Visualize the end of the path, and what do you want to be when you reach the end of the path? Now, I understood he wasn't meaning, do you want to be a doctor, a philosophy, a cave yogi? He wasn't asking that. He's asking you, what do you want to radiate? What do you want to be? How is your existence to be? Joy-filled, happiness, wise, dumb, stupid, nothing, active, inactive? Where do you want to be when you reach the end of the path? Is that a better way of saying it? It's a good question. I'll ask him again. What do you think ought to be at the end of the path? What would you like there to be at the end of the path? Where should you be? Uh, when you reach the end of the path. What do you feel is at the end of the path? In other words, can you visualize the end of the path? Many people can't. Many people even say to me, when I visualize it, I don't like what I, don't like what I visualize. And visualization is limited or produces a negative apprehension. How about this? As you get to the end of the path, uh, what would be unacceptable? Ah, there's another approach, reversing it. You reach, you spent your whole life walking the path you to the end of the path. What would be unacceptable to you? I think you should really write something down so you don't lose it and forget what it was, what was happening. I repeat, when you reach the end of the path, what would be unacceptable? Now, moving from there to another step, I suppose there's some realization that we all need to have. The first is there's a price for everything. You get married, you lose the amount of your freedom. Uh, you get married, you can't uh, do what you want to do whenever you want to do it, I think. Uh, you want to be a doctor, you know, you have to put in a lot of memorization. I think, I think so. 
Um, there's a sacrifice, the second principle is. There's a sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice is a sacrifice of self-disciplining, which means doing what leads you to your goal and not doing that which leads you away from the goal. But the human mind is pleasure oriented and lazy by nature and therefore would prefer not to be self-disciplined, not to study, etc., etc. The answer to these two questions are easy. Find joy in studying. It, it really amazed me. Uh, almost all my life has been a question of studying. Really a good piece of karma, which I am deeply grateful for, even though I work like heavens for it. But the question is, everything does have a sacrifice. And the sacrifice is self-discipline, which simply means doing what is needed to be done to attain the goal, not to do what gives you momentarily pleasure. Not that there's anything wrong with the pleasure, just that the pleasure has lured you away from the attainment of your, your basic goal. And I think the third principle here in this area of the three questions is a realization, a necessity, if you will. <coughs> Sorry. A realization, a necessity, if you will, of making the path pragmatic. The path must be pragmatic. You need to learn to find joy in walking the path. In, in simple language, you need to find joy in living. If you don't, you know, you need to find joy in your job. If you don't find joy in your job, why are you there? The money. But obviously you're not happy with the money. So why not find a job that pays less that'll make you happy? But, you know, just don't jump off the edge of the cliff. Plan it. Take time, maybe even years, to take plan to make the transfer wisely and sufficiently to find joy in your job, to find joy in your relationship, to find joy with your family, to find joy in your studying, to find joy in everything you do. Or don't do it. Oh, but I gotta. No, you don't gotta. There's a price to pay. Are you willing to pay the price? And do you have the skill or the intelligence or the wisdom to do whatever you do skillfully so it does not imprison you or anyone else, but allows you to be more and more free? The path, the spiritual pathway, must become pragmatic. In other words, you must enjoy life. If you enjoy life, <clears throat> you'll have a greater horizon of awareness, and the discipline that is needed comes easy. You know, do you have to work at eating a good meal? Of course not. You may have to work eating a bad meal. There's never, you know willpower needed to eat a good meal. You go to a wonderful party, do you have to work it having a good time? Of course not, it flows. You're with your beloved, wow. You have to use willpower? Of course not. Everything flows easily and naturally as it should. Find joy in life and life will flow and bring you the joy, the benefits, the harmony and so forth. Not just to you, but to all those primarily that are around you. What is the big singular obstacle to be overcome to continue on the path? And the obstacle is emotionality or emotional personality. Attachment, greed, and fear. Attachment, greed, and fear. Attachment, aversion, greed, and fear. Uh, for some people, it's doubt, confusion, if you will. But primarily, it's an emotional personality. How do we deal with this? How do we overcome this minor, this major primary obstacle? Well, certainly one way is by the watchword, neti, neti, neti. It's usually said very silently. It's usually said very softly. So you can hear it in your ear, but someone standing a foot or two away cannot hear it. Neti, neti, neti. Which is to say, I'm not this thought, saying I'm not that thought, I'm not thought. 
or neti, neti, neti. I'm not this body, I'm not this brain, I'm not these thoughts. That sort of thing. In other words, you're psychologically, and here the qualification, psychologically, <clears throat> you're by the neti, neti technique, you are uh, turning around and you're neutralizing the power of words over you. Neti, neti, neti. Excuse me, I apologize. Neti, neti, neti. I'm not this body, I'm not this mind, I'm not these thoughts. Neti, neti, neti. I'm not this thought saying I'm not that thought, I'm not thought. And this psychologically produces a distance, a dis psychological distance, where you can now look at the thought <clears throat> that's flowing through the mind and very easily say yes or no, accept, reject. But if you do not build this distance, this psychological distance between you and your brain, or saying it the other way, you think you are your brain, you think you're your mind, and then you think these are your thoughts. You have a vested interest in holding on to them. And that causes you to be, how should we say it, very fixed, very rigid, uh, not having very much time to adjust or any inclination or energy to improve your life or your being. As you improve your mind, you improve your life. But as long as we have vested interest in the mind being the mind and I'm the mind, it's almost impossible to control it. So the neti, neti, neti technique is tremendously, tremendously important. I think the um, next problem is there is no energy, a lethargicness, uh, a lack of energy in the, in the human body, the human brain, to, to do what needs to be done. And again, it's not so much the question of uh, the job we do, most of the time, it is simply a question of the boredom, uh, the stress. Now, events external do not produce stress. They're events. The stress occurs by our attitude and our action, our refusal to react, or our reaction to the events. And so, again, the nitty nitty, seeing I'm not this event, I'm not that event, I'm not, I'm not an event, allows us again to remove the vested interest and to see what will produce the best state of consciousness for us to attain the spiritual goal or the earth goal that we're basically trying to attain. So boredom, lethargicness, anger, resentment, all of these emotions lock up the chakras, uh, tie up the chakras, and they don't release, they cannot release any of the pranic energy and therefore, you know, as Shelley would say, most of us are among the living dead. We move, we talk, but there's no zip, there's no zang, there's no enthusiasm, there's no joy, there, there's not, not know-how. He jokingly said to me one day, find joy, become enthusiastic about life. Find your enthusiasm and follow that enthusiasm. Mystically, find your joy, follow your joy. Be enthusiastic. Do that which brings enthusiasm. And people say, yeah, I'm enthusiastic about this, but it's not going to feed the family. And the answer is, it will feed the family very well in time. So, you know, it's like my starting the temple, you just say, okay, I want to start a temple, and everything works out. No, I was holding three and a half jobs a week down, you know, trying to pay for the rent and all the things, expenses that went into it. But it was not pain and anguish and suffering. It was a joy because I was following my, my dream. I was following my enthusiasm. I was following my, what gave me ecstasy. Of course it's hard work. Of course it's sacrifice. But it's not, you know, it's like, oh, you gotta make love to your lover. I really gotta sacrifice. You know, what kind of ridiculous, I gotta use willpower. It's ridiculous. I gotta really work hard to enjoy this superb meal. It's ridiculous. I hope you hear what I'm trying to say without saying it. We need to find greater joy and freedom in our attitude and in our life and our actions so that the energies will be released. You know, I've seen it as a child growing up with my stepsisters. They're lying around dead, they have no energy, they can't do the dishes, they can't sweep the floor, they're just 
uh, a rag on the couch, you know. And then the telephone rings and John says, would you like to go out and pow, up they go, moving at 60,000 miles an hour to change the clothes, to wash their hair, to get dressed. We always have energy to do what we want to do. But what we want to do is not always the best thing to do in the long run. A good way of saying it? There are some people that, how do we call them, hyped? They're constantly burning their candle on both ends. And the answer is, for most of us, there's just not enough energy. So try to produce more energy. Again, a deep meditation, a quietude of the mind, full attention without tension, a relaxed state, peaceful state, harmonious state. And the energy will begin to flow. Even sometimes when things are difficult, go in and imagine a beautiful piece of scenery uh, you had on vacation, uh, the Rocky Mountains, the Gobi Desert, uh, the Canadian Rockies, you know, Grand Canyon, you know, sunrise, the sunset, the Milky Way, a series of falling stars. Back and remember something that was beautiful, exotic, unique, rare, and relive it in your mind. And that reliving will regenerate again and again, will regenerate energy, regenerate your being, giving you energy to do, I think, what needs to basically be done. The next step is, in a sense, sort of the opposite. It's uh, <coughs> detachment and tapas. And what this is, is trying to train the mind <clears throat> to move away from its two extremes, more towards the centering. And I think this, the centering, more than anything else, is not going to extremes. And here, what you do is you just start with what we call very small denials. You know, you have your plate with so much food on it, and you sort of mark off a a tenth of it, and you eat nine tenths, and you leave it. Now that's rather difficult. Uh, you have to be careful. You tell your wife or your husband what you're doing, and then they give you more food on your plate. They don't want you know. They don't want you to starve to death. And so little things, you know. You have uh, two cups or three cups of coffee a day. Cut it down to two and a half, till you really can live with it. And and you know that's good. But then you see you do it again. You cut down the two cups. And when that adjusts, you know, it cuts down to one and a half cup. And just keep going down until you have a glass of water. And, you know, if you have to have the coffee, it usually means that uh, you're not getting enough sleep or enough energy. And so you need to get more sleep. You need to drink more water. You need to eat uh, better, fresher fruits like that. But rest is the big point. Rest, rest, rest. Try to rest more. As you... Do not rest, either because you're so busy running, ranting, and raving, which really means that you're hiding something from yourself. You don't want to see something. It's like married couples that no matter when you see them, they're always around two or three or four other people. They're never alone because there's something there that they just cannot in themselves see. They don't want to see it. And so they're active with people or active running, running, running all the time. And so slowing down... And it's asking the question, is my mind running from something? And the answer is probably yes. And the answer is okay. I think what I'll do is stop running, take all that energy that I've saved and direct it towards solving and resolving the problem. Taking a short nap after work is an excellent way. It doesn't have to be three hours. It doesn't have to be an hour. It doesn't even have to be a half hour. It's amazing if you go to sleep even for seven minutes the body regenerates, the mind really, really regenerates. So somewhere between, you know, 7 and 20 minutes, uh, then you get up and then you be a human being again and deal with the family life, uh, I think, fairly harmoniously. It's so again, get more rest. We'll remove the tendency to be more emotional or to be extreme in the emotionality. You know? uh, 
So whatever you do, all the habits that you like, you know, cottage cheese, for example, with red pepper on it, uh, that's good. You know, you're having three teaspoons a day, cut it back to two and a half, you know, cut it back to two. Uh, as a denial, you know, and then it's, you have three meals a day, you have only two meals a day, you know. Two meals a day, you just have one meal a day, you know. It, uh, and then try to eat the meal earlier in the day, you know. We, we have this habit of eating one meal a day, except when I'm in Chicago. <laughs> in normal sane society, there's one meal a day, and it's usually before 3 o'clock, around 2.30 or so. And that's it. Uh, but the food needs to be organic and all the other things that you know or should know about. Um, and then you look at your life and you start reflecting and you ask, in the past 12 years or the past 30 years, take your choice, what are the most, three or four most emotional eruptive periods of one's life? And I think when you, when you do that, uh, you ask yourself, what was it about? And you usually find that these three or four disruptive patterns were always about basically the same thing, love life, family life, money life, and that's what you need then to focus upon and try to understand that <clears throat> it's about adjusting, adapting, and acclimatizing to make changes in your head, to not put obstacles or more obstacles in the way of your spiritual path or your path, which is a path to happiness and sanity, the path to maturity, like that. And it really, having better food, drinking more water, definitely more big important thing, getting more rest. Uh, you know, the ears need a rest, the tongue needs a rest, silence is a good thing, mona it's called, is a very good thing. Uh, we sometimes feel very insecure, and so we have to talk a great deal, ask a lot of questions or so forth. Just <sighs> enjoy people's company. It's like people come in and every so often, once every 30 years, someone comes in and says, I have no question, I'd just like to come in and say hi. Is that ever wonderful? Rather than they feel, they create problems so they can come in to talk to me. They don't have to have problems. Just come in and share a moment of silence sharing vibes, if you'll permit me. That's what it's about. And so this brings us back down, I suppose, to what we would probably call the personality. Personality. And personalities and desires, they go together. And so you probably need to make a list of your personality's desires, your mind's desires, what are its desires, what is desire, desire. And then again, you learn detachment. I, there's two ways of working it. You make a list of 10, 20, or five things, put them in the order from the most attached, desirous thing to uh, the least attached, or what is most critical, what is least critical, and work from one way up, down, or down, up. Uh, some people feel they want to conquer the big one first. And I have found oftentimes when people try to do that, they spend so much time and energy controlling, if that's the right word, this one desire, neutralizing this one desire, that they burn themselves out and all the other desires become even more out of balance. So it's usually better to start with the, the simpler ones, the least critical ones, and slowly, little by little, become detached and break the habit, change the habit. Recognize, you know, if you keep this up or you increase this habit a hundredfold or for a hundred years, what will the end result be? And people say, that's ridiculous. I'm only going to be here for another 30, 40 years. And the answer is, you're here forever. You're immortal. And changing the habit now will improve the world later, in this lifetime or in the next. The personality, it's called, the obstacle removal here is called detachment. Think of your mind and body as being another personality, as a sub-personality of you as an adjunct to you, but not you. You know, do you cut your hair and say, ouch, ouch, ooh, ow, ooh, ow, ooh, 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 ooh. You don't do that. If you're a child, you cry, and your hair is being cut. I'm never quite sure what <laughs> uh, or why. 
the point is, you trim your fingernails, you don't feel any pain. In the same way, your personality, if you're detached from it and realize this is not me, then there's not all this attachment and emotionality. The third in this area is you have to do something. That's what the word Kriya means. You really have to do something. And I remember maybe 50 years or more ago, uh, must be 55, 60 years, they were walking down Rush Street, and uh, it was Sunday morning. And there were two women in front of me, obviously quite wealthy, affluent, where they were dressed, the way they were speaking. And I was walking behind them and thinking about my chore ahead of me and how I'm going to enjoy it. And we came around a corner, they came around the corner, and the one said, oh, look at Mabel, look at the man in the street. And there was a man in the, in the gutter, and uh, I'm thinking quite a strong alcoholic, and I was bleeding from the mouth. And the other one said, yes. And the other woman, as they walked on, said, we must hurry to church, we'll pray for him. And they walked on. And I, it is a satori for me, and I have a feeling that quite often this is the nature of life. I keep telling the story because some of you are not hearing the meaning of the story. Maybe I'm a poor storyteller. Uh, we have to do more than just pray for ourselves or for others. Kriya, we really need to do something. And yet that doing is, is, is critical because we really cannot interfere in people's lives. We need to help them not interfere in their lives. Another approach to removing the obstacles in one's life is the niti, shanti, shanti, shanti approach, which you go into yourself and uh, you have a little pain in your body, for example, and so you pray for all the people in pain that their pain will be removed. You know, you inside yourself again another day or so and uh, you realize that finances are a little tight and then you pray for all the people that have no money, that need money, that they get money. In other words, you take the problem that's in you and you externalize it out into the world and your energy is being prayed for them till you realize that the problems we have, which are real problems and can be quite serious, are really nothing, really nothing compared to the unfoldment of uh, the pain and problems that other people have. So, returning back around and saying it again, we remove the obstacles in our pathway, the obstacles, by getting more rest, by drinking more water, by exercising more, uh, by eating more fresh fruits and colored vegetables. Uh, we remove the obstacles in our life by studying more. And studying can be studying yoga or mysticism. But it also includes the study of literature, the study of history, the uh, study of civilizations, decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbons. You know, it, it, it reveals the problems of the past or the problems of today. It reveals how they solved the problem or how they tried to solve the problem or how they didn't solve the problem and yet to be solved. And there's not much difference between a civilization and a person <clears throat> living in that civilization. There really isn't. Okay? Very little. And so the question is, how do we? Well, we begin by making our body strong. We talked about water, exercise, diet, uh, study to improve the mind. But again, there's a deeper level here. How do we call it? A contentment. We need to establish within ourselves a contentment. Uh, with contentment, the immune system grows and manifests and becomes very protective of our mind-body. Uh, as we are under great stress and under great dissatisfaction or under this illusion that we are the victims, the whole immune system just collapses and you catch colds and all things of this nature. 
when we begin to look deeper, having solved those obstacles, there's another obstacle that's subtler but maybe even more damaging. And that's what I call symbolic suggestion. It really is all the advertisements that you see, all the negative things that people say, all the literature that you read, all the religious literature that's negative. All of this is coming at you symbolically and otherwise, and it has to be neutralized. There's two approaches. I'm not a smoker, okay? And when television was at its height, uh, all the ads were really for tobacco, you know, naked women, horses, and tobacco, as I call it. Uh, and I remember talking to a number of people that are in the advertising field, and I was saying, look at all the money they wasted. You know, they spent millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars advertising smoke cigarettes, smoke our brand of cigarettes, which are really only owned by, I think, two companies, maybe one combined. And the point is, no, 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 you missed the point, Kriyananda. We're not aiming it at you. We're aiming it at people who have a proclivity to smoke, that they'll start smoking. We're aimed at people who are smokers to smoke more, more frequently and more often. You know, one of the big things was <coughs> the Hollywood stars were, <coughs> there was called the indirect advertisement. Uh, after every love scene, the first thing you do is they light up cigarettes. It was a good idea, you know, every time person got into a love situation, a new romance, first thing you know, light up cigarettes are very romantic. Today it's a little, little it's a little different, you know, they go into a, a place and someone, you know, it's like this, they're having a conversation, this, I need to drink, you know, or, you know, you drive by a, a, an ad, you know, this, all of these are things that people pay for in the movies to expose you symbolically or directly to it, uh, becoming more pointed and more overt, but it's the same thing. You have to look at your world, sit back and sort of see it. And as you <clears throat> sit back and you see your whole world, I think you need to ask yourself, what is the world saying to me? What is my environment saying to me? What is my beloved saying to me? What is my spouse saying to me? I hope it's the same person. Uh, what is my family saying to me? What is my civilization saying to me? What is my community saying to me? What is the newspaper I'm reading saying to me? What are the TV channels I'm watching saying to me? What is everybody saying to me? What is the symbolic suggestion? Now, there may be a whole bunch of different suggestions which basically tend to neutralize and all it produces is confusion. But sooner or later, the person with the most money, putting in the most money into the ads, that tends to override and it's directed at you, not just through one thing. You know, you know look at uh, TV today and it's no longer cigarette. It's take this pill, you know, see your doctor, ask for this pill. Some of the ads are so ridiculous, you don't even know what it's for. <laughs> Dr. Krejci said a woman came in some years back when this was first getting very strong. A woman said, I want that pink pill. <laughs> he says, what's your sickness? She says, I don't know, but I want that pink pill. So he finally got her to say what her problem was. And he said, oh, but the, this isn't for that. And she says, I, I want that pink pill. <laughs> That's it. You know, power of suggestion, if you want to use the word. It, it's sad and it's ridiculous. And even today, you know, the drugs are, uh, you know, they're not selling enough over the counter, so now they're selling prescription drugs. And you, you, I'm sure you saw the ad. The, the suggestion is, you know, uh, write in, call in for this free sample. Now, it's a, it's a prescription drug. But there's a doctor in the other end who's getting paid well and says, yes, yes, what do you have? Oh, I see. You probably have this. Why don't you try this and see if it works? And then go see your doctor. And they send you the prescription drug. It's, it's ridiculous, illegal, and a lot of other things. Uh, but, you know, how do we say it? Different people have different agendas, and you have to be sh sure you're not shot by their agenda. Symbolic suggestion. And you have to remind yourself, <coughs> I'm not a smoker, speaking symbolically. You have to remind yourself, I'm not a violent person. You have to remind yourself, I'm not a victim. You have to counter all that enormous amount of energy coming at you through the television, uh, through the magazines, or almost all. These see uh, Reader's Digest lady, even Prevention Magazine is just loaded with drugs, you know, most of them prescription drugs telling you to see your doctor. You go to the doctor, I want this pill. You know, and the doctor says, well, she's got this disease and she's got this problem, I better give her the one. Because what they found out is if they give you a different one, it doesn't work, then they, they get very upset at you and they find another doctor. 
Uh, and you know, the whole problem is that the doctors, 90%, uh, 95% of their retirement fund is in pharmaceuticals. So, you know, what's he gonna do? Give you this pill, that pill? You get a pill anymore? Never. You get a prescription anymore? Never. Groups of three or five, right? And it's called vested, it's called vested interest. And as long as they have this vested interest, it should not be uh, having the, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. But that's neither here nor there. You have to protect yourself from other people's dreams and greeds and uh, their agendas. You have to remind yourself symbolically that uh, these are the things that are important to me. This is what I am and this is what I am not. So that therefore, the symbolic suggestions coming through magazines, newspapers, television, and other people's conversations do not get to you and move you in a direction you really do not want to go. And I think really those are the key things that I probably would talk to you about and think are important. Know where you're going, know what your dream is, and certainly find joy in it. And if you find no joy in it, then I think there's a real problem. Namaste ji, my beloved. Be thou blessed. Be thou blessed. Be thou triply blessed that you will be an ever greater blessing to all you meet. Be at peace, be protected. Be at peace, be protected. Be at peace, be protected. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti hi hi. May all the world find peace and tranquility. May all the world find auspiciousness. May all the world find health and happiness. May all the world find wisdom. Om Tat Sarom. Aham Brahmasmi.